He has traveled the globe studying snakes, lizards, and crocodiles for over 50 years. And after all this time, there is still one creature that fascinates him beyond all others. He may never have seen one in the flesh, but it's there in every reptile he studies. For Rom, it's the king of the reptiles, the animal that symbolizes nature's most amazing adaptations and magical abilities. It's the dragon, and I'm on a quest to track one down. You know, this little Godzilla I made when I was four years old. My mother saved it all these years. In fact, it's an antique now. <laughs> you can see what a strange little mind I had in those days, and I haven't really changed much. The passion is still there. This passion has led Rom Whitaker to a life's work conserving and breeding reptiles in the wild and at Rom's snake park and crocodile bank in India. <laughs> As a herpetologist, the fantastic dragons of his childhood dreams have been replaced by real creatures. But the more he has learned about reptiles, the more Rom is convinced that reality is always stranger than fiction. You know, I've been doing this all my life. Well, something similar to this. Playing around with snakes, playing around with lizards, playing around with nice crocodiles like this. But dragons? Well, everyone knows about dragons. They can fly, they spit fire, they live forever, they guard gold in caves, treasures. They eat people, especially maidens, and they're occasionally slayed by one hero or the other. And you may or may not believe in all their attributes, supposed attributes, but I think I can find all their qualities for real in my world, my world of reptiles. Hereford Cathedral, deep in the English countryside, may seem like a strange place for Rom to start his journey, but Hereford has an ancient map that's a dragon hunter's dream. This is Mapa Mundi, an incredible medieval map, painted on an animal skin. You know, for being so old, it's still a lot of features are very familiar. There's the Nile River here, the Ganges River up there, Jerusalem right in the center here. The United Kingdom is way down here. The Red Sea and Ceylon are up in that corner there. So it's a pretty far out map. But to me, the most evocative part of it are the creatures, the animals. There's a griffin, there's a minotaur, there's a winged serpent, and of course, there are very, very dragon-like creatures. As a scientist, Rom knows far more about real reptiles than the map makers of yore and their superstitious chronicles. But he still believes there are dragons at large in the natural world. The opening chapter of his quest is the chronicle of the man-eating dragon. Perhaps the most famous dragon story of all is an archetypal myth that is set in Africa. Once upon a time, a dragon settled in by a lake and terrorized all who lived nearby. Only live human offerings appeased it. 
Eventually, it was the turn of the king's daughter. But before she was devoured, a hero arrived, did battle with the beast, and slew it with his lance. Like all archetypal myths, some element still rings true to modern ears, particularly to a herpetologist. St. George, the Turkish-born hero, was based on a real historical figure. And as for his dragon, there's one obvious contender, the Nile crocodile. Uh, this is great. It rained last night, and the water's pouring down here. And uh, obviously, the concentration of birds and crocs is because all the fish have been washed down. But the crocs are out basking as well, so there's some feeding, some basking. They're all around me. <laughs> There's one basking with his mouth open over there. Classic. Some really big ones. The biggest Nile crocs are giants. They can grow up to 20 feet and weigh a ton. And they're fast, swimming and even running at speeds of up to 10 miles an hour. With more than 60 teeth, they can devour half their body weight in a single feeding. But what makes this creature truly dragon-like is that each year, these crocs are reported to kill more than a hundred people. They are worthy adversaries indeed. But Rom is not out to slay dragons, just to track them. Back to their very beginnings. The second chapter of Rom's quest is taking him deep into the heart of old Europe and the chronicle of the dragon's lair. Ljubljana, Slovenia, a land of lofty mountains, dense forests, and dark fairy tales. Dragons are deeply ingrained here. In fact, it's the symbol of Ljubljana. They're everywhere. Although Slovenia's capital may be crawling with dragons, as everyone knows, a dragon's lair itself needs to be deep within the bowels of the earth. Fortunately, this country has some of the world's finest dragon real estate, here in the Postojna cave system. These caves are not only natural Gothic cathedrals, they are known as the birthplace of speleobiology, the science of cave life. There's a menagerie of most peculiar animals living in the inky blackness. And perhaps the most bizarre is what locals in the past believed was a baby dragon. Like a medieval knight, Rom prepares to enter the dragon's realm. This is the modern version of Dragon Hunter's armor to protect me from the cold. Even through full armor, the chill of a Slovenian cave pool is quick to numb the senses. But soon, out of the gloom, strange visions begin to take shape. Rom has spent a lifetime scouring the planet for the weird and the wonderful. But this is something even he has never seen before. No one knows how many of these creatures exist, but they are only found in caves in this small corner of Europe.
The baby dragon in this watery lair is in fact a blind salamander known as the Proteus or the Ulm. Okay, this is it. This is the Ulm. Look at this creature. The Ulm looks like almost nothing else on the planet. Living in perpetual darkness, it has lost its eyes and its pigment. As it matures, it retains its juvenile form into adulthood, like an enchanted frog trapped inside a tadpole's body. It's got legs, but amazingly enough, only two toes on the hind feet, three toes on the front feet. When you think about the creature and its natural history, what's known about it now, it's just as far out as the idea of it being a baby dragon. This is a creature that can live for 60 years, maybe even 100 years. It's a creature that can go without food for six to 10 years and with a very, very low metabolic rate. And to the imaginative medieval mind, this baby dragon could even have wings or at least external gills, bright red with oxygen rich blood. As far as the tree of life is concerned, this creature is very, very much out on the edge. He's out way out on a limb. The Ohm might not be the biggest creature in the world, and it's not even a reptile, but dragon is a state of mind. And its long fasts put Rom in mind of dragons waking from eons of slumber, famished and dangerous. But however dangerous a hungry dragon might be, it's nothing compared to the wrath of a dragon whose lair has been plundered. Rom's quest heads east to India and the Chronicle of the Dragon's Horde. As readers of The Hobbit know, Bilbo Baggins' dragon, Smog, doesn't just live in a cave. He guards the cave's vast hoard of treasure. Ram grew up with old Indian tales about the lengths to which wealthy Maharajas would go to protect their riches. With thieves and villains everywhere, the princes turn to deadly kings for help. With unblinking eyes, the King Cobra is as vigilant as any dragon, capable of killing a man with a single bite. But for Rom, this treasure is too much to resist. Forget the gold. He's after the Cobra. This is India Jones, not Indiana. Yet it's easy to see how this mighty serpent could strike fear into a lesser heart. People are understandably very, very frightened of venomous snakes. And uh, I mean, you know, getting bitten by a snake and then seeing someone dying it's like a bolt from the blue. And just consider the fact that a king cobra can grow to 18 feet long, producing seven milliliters of venom, enough venom to kill an elephant or a couple of dozen puny human beings. <laughs> Rom has been lucky enough to survive several venomous snake bites. But in the process, he's developed an allergy to modern antivenom. A bite from this snake would almost certainly be fatal. Venom is just a step away from fire and leads Rom into the next chapter of his quest, the Chronicle of the Fire-Breathing Dragon. If you're unfortunate enough to be on the receiving end of its strike, this Indonesian spitting cobra does indeed spew fire. It may be smaller than its Indian cousin, but it makes up for it with some serious attitude. Not content to deliver its lethal venom in a bite, it's developed a technique for spraying it directly into the eyes of any potential adversary. Man, this is the ultimate defense. If I was a mongoose, I'd be running in the other direction really fast. The snake doesn't have to get any closer than this to the mongoose. He sprays it in the eyes, and 
it hurts like heck. I mean, it's like getting soap in your eyes times 10. So the mongoose races in the other direction to clean his eyes out. The way a spitting cobra can do this is by having a venom which is very fluid. It's not as viscous as the venom of an ordinary cobra, so that it flows through the air like, like a spray gun. And uh, this probably means that the venom of a spitting cobra isn't as toxic as the very viscous, concentrated venom of another cobra, but I'm not going to try it out, of course. It's found all the way, well, over much of Asia, and several species are found in Africa. That's a pretty common snake. In Rom's lifelong love affair with snakes, it's not just cobras that resonate with dragon-like qualities. Unlike the winged lizards of the West, eastern dragons are often depicted as enormous serpents. This is the reticulated python, the longest snake on Earth. If I was a deer or a wild boar, I'd be in serious trouble at this point. This is one big, big snake. The Roman naturalist Pliny describes an Indian dragon as so enormous that it could envelop an elephant in its coils. Accounting for a little embellishment, he may well have been talking about this python. This is a python which grows to close to 30 feet long. And our female here is close to 20 feet long. They have a fearsome reputation, in fact, uh, reticulated pythons have actually swallowed human beings and uh, well this one could certainly take me down maybe not swallow me but certainly could suffocate me to death if she wanted to she is strong and also one of the most gorgeous snakes in the world look at that I mean she is totally beautiful real and imaginary serpents and dragons may dance deep within the human psyche the almost universal fear of snakes may have a hereditary component. An aversion to snakes would have helped our early ancestors stay alive. And our modern monkey cousins also display a fear of snakes that may be hardwired. thinks an attraction to fear may partly explain his passion for snakes. When I was a young whippersnapper, uh, one of the first things that re I really recall very, very strongly is going to the New York Natural History Museum and seeing those giant dinosaur skeletons. And my fertile imagination went uh, soaring into space. And it was kind of love at first sight in a strange way. And uh, I can't speak for all the other kids in the world, but I do know that there is this universal fascination, maybe fear, but certainly a fascination for something dragon-like, some giant reptile, be it a snake or be it a huge lizard. There's one thing you can say for certain, there is no neutral attitude toward reptiles. Anywhere you go in the world, people are either fascinated by them or absolutely scared out of their wits of reptiles. That includes snakes, and to some degree lizards too, because in the psyche, in the mind, the lizard could be that dragon, it could be that dragon in your dreams. There's more to dragons than hoarding gold, devouring maidens, and fighting with fire. The serpents and dragons of the east are known for their wisdom. Even the dragon Smog was fond of a riddle. Rom believes he can find a creature of flesh and blood to match the legendary cunning of these mythical beasts. His quest takes him to Sri Lanka for the chronicle of the wise dragon. Intelligence and adaptability are two keys to success, especially where territory has been shared for centuries with multitudes of people. 
Here in the suburbs of Sri Lanka, water monitors have not only survived in society, they've become an essential cleanup crew. By night, they still seek the safety of undisturbed mangrove swamps. But as they wake with the heat of the morning, they make the short commute across the river to earn their keep at the fish docks. Where human development has diminished their usual prey of small fish and mammals, the monitor has been quick to learn that human presence isn't all bad news. Each morning, instead of heading out to hunt, they wait in line for their daily handout. We've got uh, 10 large adult water monitor lizards here. And they probably weigh on the average about 50 pounds each, so you've got about a quarter of a ton of water monitor lizards a couple of yards away from the main highway on the west coast of Sri Lanka here. I don't particularly agree with the idea of polluting the river, but these are the scavengers who clean it up. You know, Sri Lanka is kind of weird in the sense that they don't have any vultures here, no vultures at all. So these guys play a role in the river anyway of cleaning the place up. Adaptive scavenging behavior like this is more often seen in mammals than in reptiles. But for Ram, this lizard is so smart, it almost transcends its cold-blooded heritage. Whenever I've watched water monitor lizards, to me, of all the reptiles, these are sort of the most mammalian, you know, the, the kind of reptiles that we can really identify with because they have that curiosity. There's one licking my leg right now. They have that opportunism. They're kind of like a, a reptile mongoose, if you put it that way. And, uh, you know, no other reptile seems to have the kind of intelligence or awareness or alertness that these reptiles have. This is very unlike most reptiles who are much slower and laid back and sort of glazy-eyed, you know what I mean? Monitor lizards have been reported to cooperate with each other in foraging by luring crocodiles away from their nests so they can steal their eggs. And feeding studies have shown that one species is even able to distinguish numbers up to six. In effect, it can count. But smarts alone don't make a dragon. You need a bit of ferocity, too. With a little imagination and some oil paint, right here in Sri Lanka, there is all the horror of a medieval dragon. The water monitor is still a predator at heart. Where dragons of yore may have demanded fleshy sacrifices, today's clever monitor is more practical in its expectations. And here in Sri Lanka, instead of a fox in your hen house, beware the giant lizard. I'm literally nose to nose with a seven and a half foot water monitor lizard. I know about this guy because he's a regular visitor to this yard. They keep chickens here and he keeps visiting in the hopes of getting one. In fact, he occasionally does get one. He's a well-known citizen of this area. When water monitors approach their full size, they seem to throw off another one of their reptilian constraints. A big lizard like this doesn't have to bask in the sun in the morning to be warm. Whatever he, heat he gained the day before, he's ready to go early in the morning. A small lizard has to bask first before it can rev up and get going. Free from the reptilian need for constant thermal regulation, the water monitor becomes a much more effective predator and a more dangerous subject for a close-up. I'm kind of worried about that tail, though. <laughs> if he bends it back the other way, I'm gone. 
A slap in the face wouldn't be good. Whether hunting or foraging, the water monitor's keen intelligence is matched by an equally sharp sense of smell. Everything a water monitor does seems to be guided by smell. Whether it's finding food or finding a mate, that forked tongue works the same way a snake's forked tongue does. They have something called Jacobson's organs in the roof of their mouth, and they pick up particles of scent from the air and from whatever they're looking at and smelling, and it delivers it right to the roof of the mouth. That's what he's doing now. He's smelling what I've got, but he's a little wary of me. He's not quite sure about my intentions here. When dealing with an adversary too big for its teeth, the water monitor employs its next most effective weapon. And that's his main defense, if he wants to. He can give me a good whack with his tail. Smart. Better sort of keep back from it. Really? This whole tail lashing is just simply his way of trying to see me off. I mean, that's his a real, real good, very, very effective defensive whip. And it hurts. It really smarts. I don't know why he's being so nasty to me. Here I am feeding him. I mean, come on, guy. Every dragon hunter bears his scars. <laughs> And here in Sri Lanka, Ram's picked up another to add to his list. Dragons are complex beasts, part myth, part science, part dinosaur fantasy. But whatever the inspiration, one thing all dragons must do is fly. Ram is going to prove that anything fiction can do, fact can too. This is the Chronicle of the Flying Dragon. Probably the most famous flying reptile that ever existed was the pterodactyl, you know, back in the dinosaur days. A massive, leathery-winged flying creature that sort of gave us all the creeps when we were little kids. Pterodactyls may be extinct, but for Rom, their dragon-like relatives still cast their shadow upon the earth. And he's come to the rainforests of India's western ghats to catch one. It's known to modern science as Draco de Sumieri, perception of the rainforest changes every level you go up it's in tears and now I'm above the you know sort of the lower story getting up toward the canopy and there's something different every sort of every step of the way so this is dragon country flying dragon country there's a male over there flip 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 do lap if I take some time and look around there's another it's a female so they're all at this level 50, 60, maybe even 70 feet up in the canopy on the open sunlight. It's just hitting those trees over there. Just the right time of day when they're heating up. Oh, it's brilliant to see them at eye level like this. Absolutely brilliant. There are over 20 different species of Draco found throughout tropical Asia. They spend practically their whole lives high up in the canopy. There are no maidens up here. They feast on the ants that share their treetop home. When threatening rivals or attracting a mate, the males blow their cover and extend the bright yellow flap on their neck in a display called dewlapping. The view may be great up here, but Rom's natural dragon hunter's agility is somewhat hampered by ropes and harnesses. To actually catch one of these dragons, he is going to need a new weapon, a lance with slight modifications. The Greek historian Herodotus describes throngs of winged serpents guarding trees in Arabia. Scholars have long argued over what exactly he was describing. Rom's got his own theory. This plantation is thousands of miles from Arabia, but it is swarming with Draco. And the male does indeed guard the trees of its home territory from other encroaching males. But when faced with a dragon hunter's lance, 
Its main form of defense is evasion. It may be only nine inches long and live on a diet of ants, but when Draco has nowhere left to run, it matches its mythical namesake and takes to the sky. This side, this side, this side. Hi. Okay, little guy. Quickly, quickly, gently, gently. Oh, 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 oh. Okay. Ron's perseverance finally pays off. One amazing lizard. It's a male, for sure. It's got this huge yellow dewlap. It's really fragile. Look at this. I'm trying to be as gentle as I can with it because it just seems like skin and bones. And probably most remarkable of all, if you gently stretch it out, they've got these amazing wings. Look at that. The first time I ever saw one of these, I thought a butterfly was floating over me. R literally. Then I saw it land on a tree and catch an ant. That's no butterfly. <laughs> this is, to me, one of the most remarkable reptiles on the planet. And Rom believes Draco's amazing dragon-like abilities wouldn't have been lost on earlier visitors to these regions. Back in the days of yore, you know, uh, explorers would go to the deepest, darkest parts of the East Indies. They'd come back with real drawings of things like rhinoceroses. These are the first time the civilized world had seen anything like this. But they'd also come back with amazing, fanciful drawings of lizards looking very much like this, only they depicted them as 30-foot-long flying dragons. They looked very, very much like what we've got here. So they really did see some real stuff, but then their minds went a little bit wild and sort of took it to the extreme. And uh, maybe that's why they called it Draco. I'm sure that's why they called it Draco. So far, Rom's journey has taken in man-eating crocodiles, cave-dwelling Methuselahs, reptiles that fly and spit fiery venom, and fierce lizards as smart as mammals. Now, he seeks a dragon that needs no embellishment or artistic license. The final chronicle, is of the real dragon. By the 19th century, the idea of dragons roaming the earth had been dismissed as medieval superstition and fantasy. But only 80 years ago, scientific certainty was thrown into disarray with rumors of a remote island that could have come straight from the Mapa Mundi. It was home to a giant creature never seen by the outside world. In 1926, the American Museum of Natural History launched an expedition to capture a beast that even science would call a dragon. For Rom, his first visit to Komodo is the climax of his life's obsession with reptiles. In his excitement, he too can almost sense the monsters in the landscape. For a dragon hunter on a crusade, this is the Holy Land. I can just imagine how it must have felt being on that first expedition from the American Museum of Natural History coming to Komodo, all these crazy stories about a giant reptile still wandering around in this, this kind of landscape. I mean, actually getting a few shivers thinking about it, but uh, the idea of finding a big dinosaur-like creature alive in this day and age just blew everyone away. And then when they got here, 
and actually started wandering around and then came face to face with the first really big Komodo dragons. Ah, that is true excitement. I mean, oh man. We're really looking at a primeval landscape here. If, if there was ever a place that deserves to have a dragon, this is definitely it. The next morning, Rom's chance to see a living dragon has finally arrived. His first footfall is like stepping back into a Jurassic past. Walking through this King Kong landscape, he can't help thinking about the dragon's fearsome ambush abilities and the people who've been killed and eaten on these very islands. Nah. This is the first time I've ever seen a wild Komodo dragon. <laughs> you know, we're used to all the different kinds of monitor lizards I've been seeing all over the place, and there's never, there's just not any of them as massive as this creature is. Here's a real land predator, you know, stomping around like a dinosaur leaving footprints like a dinosaur. I mean, it's everything I ever expected. Real dragons live within fixed territories, and the population where Rom has landed show absolutely no fear of humans. And for once, after 50 years around large reptiles, it's Rom's turn to show some fear. What is it? I didn't do anything. Whoa! Whoa! No, no, I, I didn't do anything. I really didn't. I don't, and I don't have any meat. No, I don't. Nothing. Uh, really? There are very few reptiles who will do this. They say that reptiles get tired real easy. <laughs> How about humans, man? <laughs> Tiring me out. This is scary, you know. I, I, the only time I've ever been chased a crocodile at her nest. Not a free-ranging big, big lizard like this. And from what I understand, it's not just for fun. If he catches me, if I trip, I'm meat. Rom's right to... As recently as 2007, an eight-year-old boy was attacked and killed by a Komodo dragon, not far from this very spot. You know, when I first landed on the beach there, I just wandered around all by myself, you know? And uh, I wouldn't do that now, no sorry. On the few islands they inhabit, these dragons are the top predator. They can eat 80% of their single meal and are believed to have a sophisticated and sinister technique for killer is often described as a foul cocktail of virulent bacteria that would turn even the smallest bite into a dangerous wound. This deer has been bitten by a dragon. It's simply a matter of time before it succumbs to blood poisoning. And it won't take long for the Komodo dragon and its friends to track it down and then do what they do best. Scientists have tried to discover which area makes dragon drool so toxic, a reptilian fiery bite. Rom wants to get to the bottom of the... Do this, he needs... The dragon slayer of yore was the most courageous of knights. And we've got the modern day equivalents. Komodo expert Jerry Imansaya, Big Denny Perwandana, and sometime dragon fanatic Rom Whitaker. Enter the dragon.
It has stretched from tiny Olm and diminutive Draco to Dragon. But here on Komodo, you don't need your imagination. This may seem an extreme form of capture, but the searchers have been working with these for many years, and this practice is harmless to the dragon, if not to the researcher. Okay. Good, good. Cool. Okay, got it. That should be good, yeah. Okay. I've caught a lot of crocodiles, but... Uh, I didn't realize how strong these guys can be, and he doesn't run out of steam, man. We'll sort of, you know, he'll, he'll get tired in, you know, a few minutes, and this guy just, oh man, he's endlessly, endlessly. Now look at these nails, huh? It's like a big eagle's claws or something. Because of other Komodo adversaries have left scars all over this animal's armor-plated back. But it's not just the claws you need to watch out for. 60 teeth? 60 teeth. <laughs> sharp teeth, very sharp teeth. Someone said, yeah. yeah. Because they have the edge and yeah. the knife edge. Okay, he's getting calmer. Calmer he may be, but this is still the largest lizard that Rom has ever handled. Yeah. Eight feet and. Well, the biggest water monitor we ever measured was a little over seven feet, uh, getting close to eight. This, at eight and a half feet, is getting to amongst the largest size Komodo dragons you can find. This is water. When it is in a league of... Water monitors can weigh five pounds, can tip the scales at over 360 pounds. Tamed. It's time for rum. <laughs> and basically what we'd like to do here... ...of its saliva. Okay, okay. ready? All right. Okay. It's going to be very interesting to see what we can culture with this. Okay, his legs are loose. Okay, on your marks. Get set. Low oh, metabolism of reptiles means that most tire very quickly and take a long time to recover after exertion. But even after being sat on, it is up and away. Look at that. He's taking the tidbit. Recovery time is like what? 30 seconds? Seen anything like it? Offerings made. Feelings. A drag. Saliva samples in hand heads for the nearest lab. It might not be the most conventional, but at least it's safe from hungry dragons. The next step in logical study sample of saliva and samples. No, I'm. Basically taking a swab, um, what I just did, in order to, uh, we can get the kind of, from both the human being and the dragon. The dragon's saliva and Rom's own are smeared into different petri dishes on which bacteria thrive. This is not exactly the most sterile situation you can imagine, but... I should know what I'm doing because way back in the Vietnam War days, I was trained in this stuff as a lab technician. Man, I took hundreds of swabs and took lots of blood samples from thousands of soldiers. I actually never thought I'd be doing it with... Do it. I gotta, gotta incubate overnight. We should see something. Rom's hoping the samples decisively who's more dragon or dragon hunter. Twenty-four hours after inoculation, Rom's experiment has come up with some graphic results. Yeah, he's tried to culture from Komodo saliva is Pasturella multicida, a strain that can kill a human within days of entering the blood. And this plately. Look at this growth. This is absolutely amazing. Not the mark of Zorro. This is just the streak that I did. Probably bacteria here, and one of them could very well be Pasturella. And this is counted as the most virulent of all the bacteria found in Komodo dragon saliva. But the Komodo isn't the only potentially deadly drool. Looking at the mouth swab from Rom with 
we're looking at a growth likely be E. coli. Now, E. coli is a, a common, this could very well be one. And in fact, it's already been more or less proven that there are 80 or more different species isolated from the human mouth and only 57 from the dragon's mouth. Obvious conclusion here, you do not want to be bitten by a Komodo dragon, nor do you want to be bitten by Rom Whitaker. Rom's experiment has shown that in these tropical conditions, any saliva is a potentially lethal cocktail. But this doesn't as formidable. I've got a brand new respect for these dragons. They really understood or realized what I was going to meet. To be there, to experience them, is something out of this world. They have different personalities, that's for sure. There are some fairly calm ones, some very serious ones. In fact, so serious that I was definitely on the menu with that. And if we thought we were at the top of the food chain, well, meeting up with a dragon like that, you have to think. I think uh, uh, we're very, very conscious of this visceral fear we have of being prey. A tiger, a leopard, toss us around like a rat, and swallow us down. Um, taking it to another level, there's something even more tough. A giant python, in case a giant lizard on Komodo. There's something that makes you shiver just a little bit. Even a guy like me who's supposed to know reptiles really well. Despite the scientist within, Rom's in the real world has opened his eyes' abilities. He's realized that whatever's compulsion for reptiles may be the same thing that's made the dragon such an enduring symbol all around the world. And the story of their powers is Stim investigates a nest of freshly hatched dragon eggs. He marvels at what science has discovered, that dragons have an ability that in humans would be considered miraculous. A real, truly about the Komodo dragon. And that is that a female can lay viable, fertile eggs without having mated with a special strategy, a special... Komodo dragons swim from island to... Here we are in a maze, almost 18,000 in the Indigo. And let's say, sir, let's say a volcano blew up. And, well, one of the females managed to swim off another island. Now, thing. All alone on a new island, Komodo can still lay fertile mate. Other lizard females can do this, but they produce only female young. Komodo is unique. She can give birth to her own future mate. A female Komodo dragon washed up on this island here. Now, she was alone. There were no other Komodo dragons there. But she laid a clutch of eggs and produced five viable offspring. Males. Not twins, not clones, genetically distinct males, which could, when they matured, mate with the same female. There's more offspring. In this case, because it was sexual reproduction, she was able to females. Oh, she is without an atom. A population springs up, compen females. I'm Chances are that a traveling male may find the island and bring new into the mix. The dragons have conquered a new land. For Rom Whitaker, scientist, the abilities of reptiles continue to astonish and well, and all around us in the real world. program is available on DV9 plus shipping. To order call 1-800-336-1917. Next time on Nature, the polar bear Built to survive the missing north, the grizzly would rarely meet, but the Arctic is melting. Will the grizzly claim the Arctic? Hang on.
To learn more about what you've seen on this nature program, visit pbs.org.